we have to charitably hear people. I always tell people, you got to listen to people long enough to know that you disagree with them. Mm. When people, when people right out the gate are like, Arr! I'm just like, well, what, what, what part of it do you disagree with? Have you, have you listened long enough <laughs> to, to actually be able to identify the parts in which you disagree with and why you disagree with them? What is your counter argument around that? <laughs> Thank you for watching another episode of the Jew3 Project podcast. And as always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew3 Project. And today I'm joined by someone who is no stranger to the Jew3 Project, who's a friend of mine, who has was just with us for Courageous Conversations, um, Dr. Christina Edmondson. Welcome, uh, Christina. Thank you, Lisa. Hey. <laughs> For those who didn't see you on the episode, you did the episode with Truth Table, uh, and you did the episode by yourself on bitterness. Uh, for those who haven't seen those episodes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, just give them a little bit about who you are. Sure. Yeah. So I am um, a higher higher education administrator. I work at a Christian college in the Midwest. And um, I also help to co-host a podcast called Truth Table. Um, and we talk about whatever we want to talk about, but usually, usually that's related to um, culture, faith, justice, et cetera. Um, I am a pastor's wife, which I almost feel like is a unique, it's a unique world that I've learned about as of late. And um, I'm a mom of, of two lovely uh, little girls. Today just so happens to be, I think, National Daughters Day. So shout out to uh, the daughters of the world. Um, and yeah, that's a little about me. My academic background is in sociology, emphasis in race, class, and gender, uh, family systems, a master's of science degree in that, and a PhD in counseling psych. Um, but a lot of my work has, in the last few years, has been around um, using those skills, I hope and pray, to talk um, about um, issues related to intercultural development and anti-racism. So that's what my work looks like, Lisa. Awesome. And you do a lot of uh, social media engagement, which is <laughs> something <laughs> we're going to talk about today. Um, I know we both try to use it carefully. Um, sometimes I feel like I don't want to use it at all. But <laughs> um, that is uh, social media. How do we engage as believers? Um, I think, you know, as I was telling you before we hit record, mm -hmm. that when I log on Twitter specifically, because I think Twitter platform is just like this um, versus Facebook and Instagram. It, it feels like when I scroll through my timeline, I'm walking into a room where a whole bunch of people are yelling at each other. And <laughs> it's like, we assume that we've made progress because we've been retweeted a bunch of times or we mm -hmm. really made an impact. But yeah. really we're just talking to our own echo chambers of people sure. who are like we think and are retweeting us. So we have to question the impact we're really having. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts about social media and how have those thoughts evolved over time? <laughs> so, um, wow, all, all kinds of thoughts, but, the, and, but many of my thoughts are, so I, I haven't written anything formally on this and I've actually thought about just getting ideas together and maybe writing something on it. Not necessarily as an expert <laughs> by any means, like people can go and search my social media feed, but, uh, but more so as a person who's trying to think Christianly through um, all of the different modes of engagement um, and what our witness looks like in different spaces um, and how we can use those things strategically. So, so I would say about, oh, up until about three, two or three years ago, uh, I had a much more uh, low-key social media presence. And I would say I didn't really start to engage really um, actively and strategically uh, with figuring out um, that I even wanted to lean in a bit more intentionally to using social media as a platform to work through thoughts and ideas uh, up in, uh, just about two years ago. And a, a fair amount of that had to do with the fact that I, I, I'm within a higher education context and students, and particularly, um, oh, traditional age college students, 18 to 21, 22, but also younger millennials, all the way up to that age range, I know are very um, connected to social media. And 
uh, some of the things that I was hearing uh, in terms of people having a real um, frustration with um, with with the faith, with Christianity, uh, some things incredibly legitimate <laughs> frustrations. Um, I still felt like I wanted to uh, offer my voice as a, one amongst many uh, that was trying to think through all kinds of topics from a Christianly standpoint. And so um, I knew in doing that, I wasn't presenting a voice that would be different. I mean, I don't think I'm I don't think I'm a unique voice per se, but I did want to add uh, my voice because I knew that I would uh, have some. I mean, that I would have some um, some strategic measure in the way that I engage. Not always, but for the most part, I felt like, oh, I think I'll have a, I think I'll have <laughs> some some boundaries <laughs> around my, my style of engagement. And I think in some ways that can even be a witness in and of itself. Mm -hmm. That's that's interesting that you said that putting boundaries in place. Um, mm -hmm. As a social media native, I mean, Facebook came out, I think. The year I started undergrad, so mm. back then Facebook was I don't I kind of liked it better that way. You had to be a student mm. to be on. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> mm -hmm. You could only use your school ID, mm -hmm. um, and it was very you know centered around college students and mm -hmm. engagement that way. Um, you didn't have a status that you could post. I don't believe really, back then it was really more so just your pictures and interests. Mm -hmm. um, did you, could you send messages? I can't remember. It's been so long. <laughs> I think you could write on people's wall, but you didn't have a status. Yeah. Um, it was more so like MySpace a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. simplified MySpace. Um, and so I enjoyed social media, but it's, it's as people, it, as it's grown and then Twitter has come into play mm -hmm. and you could kind of post and people respond to what you post and your thoughts, it kind of has it's evolved into something that I'm not sure that <laughs> all the time is healthy or helpful. Sure. sure. Um, it has its life like everything. It has its good things mm -hmm. and bad things. Because I mean, I can argue that some can argue G three wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for social media. Because yeah. in large part, G three oh. has existed and thrived because mm -hmm. of my use of social media and how we use the social media. Sure. Uh, but then, you know, it's the negative side. So I don't want to paint social media as if it's bad. I hate some of the things that that come along with it, some of the things mm -hmm. that I have to deal with, but it's a very, it's a very useful tool. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, to your boundaries point, how do we steward it with those boundaries mm -hmm. so it it is edifying mm -hmm. um, to the people that read our stuff and yeah. not harmful? Um, right, right. So, I mean, and, and let me just say that people use social media for a variety of reasons. In some ways, it has elephants elevated and provided necessary platform and important platform for voices that are historically marginalized. If you have an internet connection and you can get a computer, well, there you go. You can talk, <laughs> you know, and that in of itself is, um, I think for the most part, a positive thing because it gives greater access to more people. Now, obviously there are people who don't have internet access and a computer so that, so you, st you still have, um, uh, a hierarchy of, of access uh, to the voices that are out there, but I think it certainly has given it greater bandwidth. And so it has allowed for the building of what people would call platform amongst folks who historically would not have had those opportunities. Um, and so in that sense, I think that is good. I think we need uh, to be able to hear people's thoughts and then we need to learn how to critically discern and engage with the ideas that people are putting out there um, to help sharpen ourselves and to refine our, our own thoughts and to repent as well when challenged, right, when appropriate. Um, I think uh, for me, when I think about uh, parameters or um, how I hope or I, I try to use my voice in these spaces is that I really value congruence and um, being the same in multiple spaces. So for me, a, a high compliment would be someone saying to me that I'm similar to how they experience me online. Like that's a, that's a compliment to me. <laughs> so and also whatever I'm willing to say to someone online, I should be able to say to their face. Um, and, and I don't mean it like in a, a particularly plucky way, but I just mean that sincerely. Like, you know, Drake, sa Drake says they don't really be the same <laughs> offline. I just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I feel like we should be able to um, have integrity 
and the way we use our voices. Not to mention the fact that working with college students, I'm always like, look, whatever you put out online, when I look for someone to hire for a position or for a leadership role or whatever, you better believe I Googled them. I do. <laughs> and because that's it's public knowledge. So the way that you treat people, the way that you present yourself, um, those things are available. And I'm not trying to get into like tone police, but I'm saying the way that you use your voice as a strategic instrument. I think that we have a burden to think about how do I use my voice as a strategic instrument, whatever you're trying to do. Um, and so, so that's, that's a, a bit of my initial kind of um, thinking about the way that I engage. So whatever I say on here, I need to be able to say to people's faces. And I have to consider, am I being passive aggressive in the way that I'm communicating? So if I have access to someone on the phone, I probably should call them. <laughs> like, you know, I should call them. I should call them. I should call them on the phone and say, this is what I'm thinking. You know, it, it took me a while. I'm still really behind, honestly, Lisa, in terms of like social media rhetoric. It took me a while to realize what like the subtweet thing is. And and so when I when I, I was already on Twitter, when I when I had to learn, like, what is subtweet? <laughs> like, what do they mean by this? And and really that, you know, that's a way of like really talking about something, but not talking directly, like looping around. Um and I think there's a, I think there is a place for um, trying to have a, a type of conversation that goes above a person, but points to a principality or points to an issue that can be wise and strategic. But there's also a way to do that in which it can just be passive aggressive. And I would say cowardly. Um, and so I try to sort through in my own heart and thinking, when am I being cowardly? and lacking love, which is an expression of cowardliness. And when am I trying to speak to a principality, to an issue um, that allows for me to not just say, hey, you person specifically, I'm calling you out, but I'm calling out this particular ideology, theology, philosophy, et cetera. Yeah, and that's helpful because um, I said this at Courageous Conversations in my closing prayer that I hope we as a body of Christ start talking to and not at and about uh, yeah. because that whole, I have access to you or I can email you or right. whatever, right. reach right. out to you in some form or fashion right. and give you that respect mm -hmm. before I blast you. I mm -hmm. think it's just common courtesy, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, that we're losing in this day. Um, when you when you are engaging people online, how do you know who to engage with? Because some people are <laughs> a very good question. trying to be combative. And I, for me, I always tell people if it's an account with no picture and it's, it's it looks like somebody's just creating a fake account mm -hmm. to engage me or to yeah. spew something or rhetoric, I'm not going to respond. I'm going to mm -hmm. block that person and keep it moving because if mm -hmm. you want to be insulting behind a fake account, mm -hmm. then you have, that's cowardly. Yeah. But if you want to engage me and ask me a serious question, then that's something different. Yeah. Um, how do you decide who to engage and who not to engage? Yeah, I, I think that's a good rule of thumb. I think that when people do not, um, people use fake accounts or they, um, you know, they, they kind of have a an, an avatar that's connected to, a hostile issue, <laughs> right? Then those are good signals. Like this person does not come in peace. You're like, you know, this is the issue. Or they're they're attempting to to rope you into a dialogue in order to position and build their their particular platform. Um, so it's not really about engaging you in a conversation, but being seen posturing and checking you or calling you out. And I think we have once again we have to examine Christianly motives. With that being said, I think there's a time and place we speak, you know, we speak truth, you know, truth to power. And we, but we speak in terms of our prophetic witness has to be for Christians. The prophetic witness has to be in line with the Christianly witness. So anything that we think we're doing that we're claiming speaking truth prophetically has to line up with the way of Christ. 
So we can't take Jesus's name <laughs> to add some extra stink on what we're saying and not take Jesus's way. You want his name, you got to take Jesus's way. And we all appeal to the authority of Christ within the within Christian circles, right? We kind of drop the God card like, da -da, God told me this, right? Um, but if we do that, that also means that we move about in the way that is, ex is expressed by the dominant qualities, the most consistent qualities of Christ's earthly ministries and through the work of the Holy Spirit on within the church right now. And so we all want to like go to like, well, I'm gonna flip tables on it. <laughs> That's not, Jesus wasn't flipping tables every day. Okay. <laughs> um, it, you know, he was, he was, he was given grace. He was speaking truth. Um, he, you know, he was calling out all manner of, of sin and calling people into account um, and living, living a life that, that showed for um, humble submission um, so that is, uh, something that I think we, we want to be known for and we want to engage in a way that says that with that, with, with that being said, I mean, there are instances where I find myself blocking, where I have blocked people. And there's a couple reasons why I might, that I would block someone. Um, one, for example, if, if I can discern very quickly that, that their whole purpose is to build a brand off of arguing with me. First of all, I just think that's bizarre. But second, <laughs> I'm like, we, we don't need to think, think somebody bigger to, <laughs> to go at it with, first of all. Um, but if, if I discern that, then I'm just not going to engage them. Partly, and I know this makes, and, and, I, and I believe this as, as sincerely as I, I believe I'm saying this in a sincere, sincere place. I don't want to tempt people to sin. And that includes sinning against me. So some people, I'm like, I'm going I'm to gonna, I'm gonna shut this down. Because obviously you have a temptation. You have a temptation. <laughs> like you are triggered. And let me just, let me take this off your, give, take this opportunity away from you because it's not good for you. So, um, so in some instances, I will just simply block in that regard. Now, there are some people in some social media platforms that I myself recognize that um, I am struggling with an ability to love them well and to see them rightly. And so what that means, in all honesty, that there are some there are some people I don't I don't choose to follow, um, not because I want to completely live in a bubble or a vacuum and censor myself. But I know that the way that they engage um, is a particular trigger for me. And I know that I will struggle to potentially love them as well as I should. And I would rather engage with them offline so that I can be reminded of their humanity and I think the internet has a way of making us think that we're just talking to a screen, but there are people behind the screen. And so I'm trying to guard my ability to rightly value and see the humanity of this brother or sister um, who I may significantly disagree with uh, by not only engaging with them in this electronic medium. Yeah, and that's so vital that see people as human. I remember when we were in the planning stages of Courageous Conversation and they were like, how do you want the chairs? And I said, I do not want the chairs facing where everybody's facing the audience. Mm -hmm. I want the chairs so everybody's facing each other. Right. Because mm -hmm. it's hard to disrespect another person right. when you're looking dead at them. It should be. <laughs> Because it reminds you that you're human. You can say a lot of things when you're not looking at a person. You can say a lot of things behind the screen. But there's a different tone, usually for the most part, that people have when they're looking. Even if they are solidified on their stance, even if they have all the reasons in the world, their tone is going to be completely different. Right. When you're staring them in the eye, and then so some people were saying, "Well, I, I would talk." I was talking to, and they were like, "Well, I would have said this, and I would say that." I said, "It's easy to say that, right? <laughs> when you're mm -hmm. not looking, right, the, the view that you differ with in the eye, it's easy to say what you would have said. It's a whole different tone when right. you're looking at someone you know disagrees with you, and how you choose your words is completely different, <laughs> right, 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 right. Um. And so I think that hu seeing people as human helps mm -hmm. um, in, our, in our engagement. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, too, Lisa, I think it's also face-to-face -face engagement and online engagement. I think, I there's, I think there's a way to, to, to cultivate what we're talking about even in an online platform. But I think so we have to, we have to charitably hear people. I always tell people, you got to listen to people long enough to know that you disagree with them.
Mm. When people when people right out the gate are like, Argh. I'm just like, well, what 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 part of it do you disagree with? Have you have you listened long enough <laughs> to to actually be able to identify the parts in which you disagree with and why you disagree with them? What is your counter argument around that? So, I I think that that's important. That's that's the charitable work of Christianly engagement with people that we disagree with. And to listen well to people who we think we agree with. Um, we, we shouldn't stop critically discerning just because we think somebody's in our particular camp, um, that they're one of us. You know, this is why we get into a lot of, of, of issues with, with um, where there's theological issues, because we will take somebody and say, OK, well, they're they're sound or, you know, they're what or whatever our, the tagline is for our particular group. And then we stop critically discerning. And the next thing you know, we, we provide to them almost a cult-like allegiance and an inability to love them well enough to say, like, you're actually off the rails over mm -hmm. here. And then we find ourselves disappointed in people when they espouse theology and practices that we're like, that's crazy. I'm like, but you haven't been listening all along. This has been this has been ramping up from a particular trajectory, but because you have just simply endorsed and stopped critically discerning, now you're shocked, surprised, and you feel betrayed. And now you're like, I can't even go to church no more, right? So, <laughs> so we want to, we need to keep our ears open. Um, that's a loving way, I think, to engage with people. Yeah, and I think uh, um, also too, and I think you alluded to this when we're engaging online with people we disagree with, make sure we're disagreeing with them and not the straw man we created. Right. Or the caricature we've created. Because and that's real tempting too. Yeah. <laughs> real tempting. So if I see uh I guess this is the the easiest probably right now would be the color thing. Mm -hmm. So if I see um uh a white woman mm -hmm. uh that is happens to be an evangelical and I argue with her and thinking she's a Trump supporter and then she and I'm I'm dealing with her on that premise. Then I get to thirty uh, two hours in the conversation, and she tells me I didn't vote for Trump. <laughs> and right. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just argue with people that may have looked like her, but have not helped. But she doesn't hold that same position, right? You know, um, that's one instance. Or mm -hmm. you know, if we do relationally, mm -hmm. if you dealt with a lot of hurt relationally and you think mm -hmm. black men are cheaters, you know, that there could be a lot of different, you know, things that we do, <laughs> how we engage with people and not, it doesn't give them the benefit of the doubt to deal with that person. They may fit the caricature, but mm -hmm. they may not. Oh, they may not. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, you know, do unto others. Right. So we, so, and the problem is, is that we all, we, we often see ourselves um, uh, more highly than we ought in the sense that we're all like, yeah, I don't do that. Well, let me tell you, I'm going to be, be real with you. I know I do that. Um, and part of it is because people actually who are kind of discerning types, one of, the, one of the consequences of being discerning, one of the negative sides of that is that you can actually um, end up going to caricature very quickly. Because you're like, I'm used to, you know, I'm, I can size people up quickly. I know where this is going to go. And you can go on autopilot. But, but reminding yourself that even if this person is going to land squarely in this particular group or this particular view, et cetera, I need to do the work of love by hearing them fully out. Um, and, and asking myself, you know, what is God teaching me through this interaction? Our interactions with others are a reflection of who say something about us. So the people who, the people who trigger me online, this doesn't mean they're not sinning against me, but ultimately I, I get the opportunity to lay before God and say, what is it that you're teaching me? What is it, what does it say about my values around, um, how I see myself, um, how important I may think my voice is, my, my desire for respect. Um, and it could be good, legitimate things that are due. Um, but but our interactions with others point to something about who we are. The things that make us angry say something about us. And it could be something legitimate, like I hate injustice, right? Um, but we still don't want to miss the lesson in the exchanges and the lesson in the interactions that we're having. I think, um, you know, so when, you know, when I'm engaging with people online, there isn't, there are times when I lean into certain questions because part of my part of what I do 
um, in my professional vocation is that of, is that of teacher. And it's not typically always in the classroom traditional teaching, but it's, it's more like a social teacher. And social media offers the opportunity for us to have good exchanges that model something for bystanders, for people that are looking in. So there are sometimes when we engage in conversations, uh, not so much because we think we're going to win the person that we're directly having a conversation with, but we could be modeling something and sharing something and signaling something to people outside of it. And I'll give you an example. I remember um, there was a woman on social media, older African-American woman, and she had made some statements around uh, modesty, women in modesty, their attire, kind of a very, uh, kind of an understanding of modesty being not about money, as scripture talks about it, but modesty <laughs> largely being about what you wear to church. And um, kind of implied that, you know, women need to watch what they wear, et cetera, et cetera. And I began to engage her on this, not so much because I don't think we should bear responsibility. We all should dress in a way that glorifies the Lord, but that, there's a lot of liberty in that, saints. Um, but but I, I started to engage her because I knew that there was a whole group of young women who were kind of done with the church that would be would be listening to that exchange. And one, I wanted to take an opportunity to model um, an, an interaction that showed that I respected this older sister, because I do. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about the implications and the trajectory potentially of that line of thinking around rape culture, around not thinking about what the scripture actually is leaning into, which is about um, modesty around economics um, and not just attire, and also to shine some light on the fact that different cultures have different attire and different, there are different body types, et cetera. So I wanted, I leaned into that conversation. I could have just been like, well, look, I think this, I don't agree, whatever, and moved on. But I felt like I could engage that in a way with this particular individual where she was going to respond back in a way um, that wouldn't be, over, you know, overtly hostile but that it could model a dynamic. And what ended up happening is I got personal emails, personal direct messages from women, young women who had looked at that exchange and had thanked me for speaking into that situation. Um, so sometimes that ends up being what happens. Um, I, I remember having a, a dialogue with someone who, from my vantage point, was saying some things that seemed um, fairly harsh and wasn't really thinking about the fact that, you know, there are hundreds, if not thousands of people who could be looking at this exchange. Um, and you don't know who the people are. And so you might want to, you know, be mindful of, of the dignity of people that you agree, that you agree and disagree with. And so I have actually privately messaged people who I was communicating with publicly as to say, I want to give you some insight into some of the people who I can tell are looking at this conversation. Because I want to give you an, because I don't want someone to do the same thing for me. I want to give you an opportunity for us both to maybe do some self correction because we might be losing a strategic opportunity to function in a Christianly way in a winsome way. And so I've, I've I've done that like behind the scenes, in order to not manipulate the conversation, but uh, to signal both of us to monitor our tone and to be more winsome in our interaction. Yeah, and that's definitely definitely helpful and insightful. I think one of the keys that I took away. From that is that you cared about uh, the person, um, even that you were disagreeing with, and <laughs> that is one of a, a a helpful tool to actually care about the person <laughs> that you're trying to correct. Be because if you're <laughs> correcting someone, um, hopefully, as a Christian, we should care about the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. that we're trying to correct because we want them to see them better. Yeah. And so how are we to change the minds of people mm -hmm. if we directly come off brash, if we, co if we come off insulting? What is the goal? I think that's one of the things we should ask ourselves when we post. What is the goal? Yeah. Like there are so many things in my draft that I want to post, but I'm <laughs> like, you know what? I'll type the whole thing out, edit it, and then I'm just like, you know what? Draft. Cause I'm not, I, cause it's like certain things can be said and they can be good. They can get a lot of retweets, yeah. but some things also need nuance. Mm -hmm. And it's like <laughs> many things. Well, and, and and it's one of the things I that I that I try to meditate on is what does it mean when we attempt to correct people beyond the scope of our love, mm. meaning correcting people <laughs> beyond our capacity of love, beyond our 
uh, legitimate inability to love them? Do I get to correct those who I don't love? So correction is an ex is actually an expression of love. And so when we are correcting people and we have lost all love, then we have to really think about, so, so what exactly is this about? Um, and it, it, I mean, it, and the truth is for all of us, people who love us the most, who, who we know without a doubt deeply, deeply love us, they actually have uh, more currency to correct us. This is why, you know, you know I grew up with a, a very you know, sweet grandmother. Um, I had no doubt that my grandmama loved me. Matter of fact, I thought my grandmama loved me more than my parents loved me, which I think honestly <laughs> was true, right? <laughs> um, and not everybody has this narrative, but, but, but I, you know, I was convinced that you know, my, my grandmother is well into her 90s. She's still with us. And, um, but I knew my, I was like, my grandmama loved me. And so when my grandmother would correct me, it would resonate so deeply with me because I could not chalk her correction up with like, okay, she just tripping or she just doesn't like me. No, mm -hmm. I know my grandmama loved me, <laughs> right? And, that, and, that's, and that's something that we have to remember as well is that when we are you know, positioning, our, positioning ourselves as like, I'm about to drop this, this information and I'm gonna correct or whatever, we have to be mindful that, that the people who are gonna have the greatest impact are the people who have made it clear that they are motivated by love as to why they are saying what they're saying and, and a love for for god a love for neighbor and even more specifically a love for us um, and that's why they end up having having more of an influence and more credibility and it's it's harder to just completely dismiss what they're saying um because it's, it's much easier to dismiss when you know that people are just saying it uh to build a platform um, when i think about um kind of the ex-evangelical movement um in a number of for example white evangelicals, former evangelicals who are angry with the church, et cetera. Um, I, I often chuckle. I'm like, no, 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 no. I need you to go back and get, and get your mama and get your uncle. Like, cause those are your, the, you ought to love those people. And it's easy for us to say like, well, I'm just not dealing with the black church no more. Well, you know, whatever, putting, putting all the church together. I'm not done, done with the black church. Oh no, 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 no. Uh, if we say that we love these institutions, if we love the people that are represented, then we actually are the ones that are best equipped, one guided and motivated by love to say, have you considered this? May I share with you my perspective? Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I love that, that you, that you shared that because one of the things that I've been talking to people about is the fact that our culture is to block or disassociate ourselves with people that we disagree with. Yeah. And the problem with that <laughs> is that is a privileged position that the average person doesn't have. So if we're in church leaders or mm -hmm. scholars, we can live in a bubble, but the rest of the world goes to work on a job with people they disagree right. with and they have to work out those differences or right. they won't get paid. <laughs> uh, so mm -hmm. we live in this privilege. Um, right. In addition to that, I had a friend who, He's, he's living a lifestyle his mother disagrees with. But he was like, you know what? My mom disagrees with this, but mm -hmm. my mom is in her fourth quarter of life. I'm not going to be fighting with her because I love her. So we're not, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So for, for, for him, his relationship was more valuable than his choice. So he's trying to find a way to navigate that situation. Mm -hmm. Um that's how most people are living with with things. And mm -hmm. so we kind of posture sometimes on social media, like you can just block people or yeah. you can do certain things. Mm -hmm. And it's like the average person in real life, they have to yeah. deal with this. Yeah. Um, and that's why for me, it's so important to challenge people to talk to because that's what oh. people, they don't have the luxury sometimes that we have when as mm -hmm. Christians with platforms mm -hmm. to just surround ourselves with people that agree with us. Most people, the rest mm -hmm. of the world has to engage with these people in the real world. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's what, what you're sharing is so vital. Well, it's, it's a gospel witness issue. So with the story that comes to mind for me when I think about, um, hopefully I'm pronouncing the, the names correctly. So uh, Euodia and Syntyche. So this is in the New Testament. And they, these are two women these are two, it, it appears two very prominent women in the church, prominent in the sense that their, their discord has an impact on the church. So it's like, look, y'all not getting along and we notice it and there are implications for it. 
Um, so it, it would almost be like two women who represent maybe two different theological camps. Like we, if you want to use our sanctified imagination, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and, you know, the apostles speak into this and they say, hey, um, I plead with you. I plead with you to reconcile. Why? Because there is a strategic gospel witness tied to what th this, this, this issue that's happening with these two women. Um, so there are lots that we can say about that. But one of the things that lets you know that this is not just women um, it, kind of in a sexist reframe of just being catty, they can't get along. No, this is a these two women, these two, these two respected women, it is vital for the church that they work this through. They figure this out and that people are looking enough so that it gets written in a letter that is now captured in the canon <laughs> for us to look at today. And so I think that's a reminder for us when we think about our conflicts that people are watching our witness. Um, and I think there is something conspicuous about a witness that says, I don't agree with you on these things. I'm not going to act like I do because it matters. I think you're wrong. <laughs> but I do agree with you on these things. And we're still going to walk together as much as we can. And I think understanding things like co-belligerence, understanding, um, uh, you know, that uh, what it means to tarry with, to walk with the weaker brother or weaker sister, recognizing that you could be the weaker brother and the weaker sister. <laughs> I mean, we always think that other person is the weaker brother. I'm like, no, might be me, you know? Um, so, and, and recognizing that people are watching our gospel witness. We are witnesses. That means we stand out um, and that people take notice of how we proclaim and what we proclaim. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Do you have time for another question? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, so I've been thinking in, in the social media engagement, how we are as believers, we are agents of hope. Um, mm -hmm. And in a hopeless world, how do we balance um, giving hope, hopeless news and hopeful news? <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Because I, I, with the, when I, I'm, I was thinking about this this morning, the suicide rate going up and how much of that is tied to our access to online um, to seeing things and hearing things. Mm -hmm. um, how do we invade that space? But be honest about the what's happening. Yeah. So not dismiss it. Because sometimes mm -hmm. that's the people's um, go-to. I just want to dismiss it and act like it doesn't exist. We're yeah. not going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But how do I balance that out? Because mm -hmm. I think sometimes in our righteous indignation, right. we spend so much time on the bad news that we never share any good. So how do we balance that out? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I'll just say a couple of things. And I hope this is is um, how it's helpful or relevant to answering this question. One of the things I tell people is that when we ignore people's suffering, it um, or minimize it, then we sometimes people will find themselves becoming even more defined by their suffering because their suffering needs uh, it needs space to be validated to be seen, right? And there's something about the way in which humans have been designed in which belief is, um, oh, is, is like, it's therapeutic to the human experience. And what I mean by that is to be believed, to be considered credible, to, for people to acknowledge, like, I believe that happened to you, that was wrong. There is something about that in and of itself that we know provides a kind of a healing quality. And right now, I would say one of the things that social media has provided is more space for unbelief. It is more space when you think about, you know, racial tension, ra racial related issues. It's more space to, to see that coworker say like, well, I mean, I know he was unarmed, but he was wearing a hoodie, you know, like, you know, that, like this. <laughs> it, it, and so and that is deeply triggering because really what people are looking for is someone to say, I see you. And I believe you. And, you know, and, that, and, and what's fascinating about that as image bearers, that deeply ties into the story of the gospel. We have a we have a we have a story that we are called to put belief in. And God is telling us to trust him and to love him through our belief, our dependency on Christ. I believe you. I believe you rose. I believe you died on the cross. Right. So belief is foundational uh, to the divine, but also to the human experience, I would say. So all of that long intro, <laughs> just to say that people um, have a longing to be validated in their suffering. And I think that we're not doing a good job with that. Uh, 
interestingly though, the Christian faith has space for that. It has, it's that's built into our faith because we have a faith that calls us to lament. And lamenting is not just us bashing or saying all the 100,000 things that are wrong with society, because it's a whole lot of things that's wrong with society, but it's being able to hold that one in one hand and also to have the other hand extend towards the hills which cometh our help. So, and I would say the Black church tradition historically has been able to do this uh, in the United States in a very unique and profound way. It has given birth to the spirituals, um, people who are not, people who are able to sing songs where they're not cushioning up nothing. Like they are saying the truth. Like I've been buked, I've been scorned. <laughs> like they're laying it out. And yet at the same time, they're crying out for a God who they know sees them and can deliver them. You did it for Daniel. Why not for me? And so I think uh, modeling that, modeling being honest about what we're seeing, acknowledging people's suffering, sitting with them in the suffering, not always giving pat answers about what well, everything happens for a reason, but no, like saying, I don't know why it happened. I know God knows, but I don't know. I know that God don't have to tell me, but I do know I'm called to sit with you while you suffer. And I know I'm called to cry with you while you cry. Um, so that, that is what we are called to do is to walk with people in that. And I think that will help us when we can balance both the lament, truthful lament, what actually is happening while pointing to where our help comes from. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, definitely helpful. Um, is there anything else you want to share on this topic? <laughs> um, some steps, some take home. I know a lot of people are dealing with um, seeing the hashtags and being affirmed and seeing them, um, especially the ones connected to trauma. And then sometimes people feel re-traumatized yeah. um, by rereading, by reading them, especially if they haven't really fully processed their own trauma. So it becomes yeah. even more traumatic. And so mm -hmm. they might need to stay off of social media while the hashtag is trending for their yeah. own sanity. Um, mm -hmm. how, do they, mm -hmm. how does one balance that um, mm -hmm. all in your closing? Closing yeah. Up. So I think so. So I'm one of those people who feels that it's important to bear witness to people's pain. And so because of that, I could find myself being being caught up in um, taking in and internalizing those those really painful images. I think that there are other ways that we can bear witness to pain and demonstrate solidarity without necessarily causing us the traumatic um, impact that will happen and the re-traumatization that will happen when we are constantly looking at images um, that we're not designed to be looking at. What humans were created to, <laughs> before the fall, humans were created to live forever. So when we engage with death and the threat of death, we should, we should expect a traumatic experience to take place. Um, so I'm created for eternity. <laughs> and so when I, when I am interfacing with experiences of death, that's not just, you know, that, that has a real impact on my, on my brain, on my health. And so I want to bear witness and I want to honor the suffering and I want to acknowledge it as true. But there are other ways to do that, like by reading um, articles, <laughs> like reading. <laughs> and, and, by, and by that, I don't mean reading articles that detail the exact description, but you can demonstrate solidarity related to suffering by being aware of the statistics and the data and the history and the practices. Uh, versus watching video images of unarmed black folk being killed. Um, so I don't necessarily know. I know that I don't need to see that image to believe that it has happened and that ha it has happened historically um, and that I need to safeguard um, my mind. Um, and I also need to honor that person's body because uh, that may not been that may not be what they wanted. They may not have wanted their body to be seen and exposed in that way. That may not be what their family would have wanted. So I want to honor uh, that person's life and their and that family's life as well. So I don't think we have to uh, submit ourselves to engaging in every every image um, that really is going to have an impact on our on our brain health. I also think that I mean this is we know this. We know that the um, social media, we know that our engagement online, we know that it's highly addictive. We know that there is literally endorphin releases in the brain. We know that it, we get habituated. All of that to say is that um, it is wise for us to build in um, sabbatical breaks uh, minimally from the internet um, and so that we can learn some things about ourselves. I mean, I know I can engage the internet constantly. Dun, 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 dun. 
And for me, what what tends to work best is more of a cold turkey approach. Like, bye, y'all. I'm gone. <laughs> you know, and I, and I say that not because I think people care about me leaving, but I say that so that I have accountability. Like I said, I was leaving. Now I really need to leave. Right. Um, that's why I say that. And I think that people need to build in bricks. And finally, I would say you need a social media accountability partner. <laughs> Um, and I know people think of, of accountability partners in kind of a cheesy way, but hey, saints, I'm just telling you, we're not meant to do this life alone. We need accountability. And so there are people that if I post something that's a little edgy or does not necessarily reflect who I am consistently or the Christianly witness I want to have, um, they screenshot it and send it to me. And they're like, are you cool? This, this, I, it, this doesn't sound like you. Or can we think through this? Um, and I appreciate that. I mean, we have to have people in our life that even if we don't always think that they're right, that we have created a type of relationship with them where they can where they can tap us on the shoulder. Um, and it's an it's a reflection of our personal immaturity and pridefulness when we have not given that invitation to people to tap us on the shoulder and to and to pull us into account. Yes, that is so helpful. I know I have people uh, that will check me in a heartbeat, uh, <laughs> to send me texts, a call, and say what's What's going on? Why are we doing? What's going on? <laughs> so um, I, I appreciate that. So I, I definitely think that we uh, somebody to hold you accountable is helpful in protecting you and yeah, just all of that. Um, how can people get in contact with you on social media? Yeah, sure. I'm I'm on Twitter, so you can look up um, Dr. C. Edmondson. I think that's what it says. Um, you can <laughs> let, let let you know how how. How much I've thought about this. Um, you can also um, listen to me with my dear friends, Michelle Higgins and Akemini Uwan on Truth's Table. Um, I'm I'm out there. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and yeah, and, and, and if you see me saying something that's crazy, <laughs> let a sister know. <laughs> we, need, we need community accountability. Um, and you can do that in love. Um, by saying like, hey, are you sure you want this to be the way you represent yourself when you look back on this a year later? And finally, I would say it's good to do a social media audit, meaning go back and look at what you were posting in 2016, in 2017, and in 2018, and think about, hmm, where was I? What, what was this all about? Because I, I can go back and look at different years and kind of get a snapshot of like, I was working through some things. So, <laughs> and that could be, it's almost like a journal entry. It can be really helpful. Yes, definitely. And if you don't, if you forget to do that, just go to Facebook Memories tab and it'll tell you where you were last year, every <laughs> year on that day. And you can look and be like, oh, I'm so glad I'm not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in my, I had some feelings that day. <laughs> yeah. So much of what we post often has nothing to do with the outside world. It has everything to do with what's going on inside. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So thank you, Christina. This has been a very rich conversation and I'm sure our listeners will enjoy it.